Uh, okay, so uh, let me just remind you where we were. So we defined a planar algebra last time, and I, I mentioned that this is one of several exotic uh, algebraic structures that we will be talking about, and indeed it is only one of several, but we'll get to the following ones uh, later. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the definition, uh, I'll only say that uh, we ended with a statement, which is that the Kaufman bracket is a morphism of planar algebras from the planar algebra of tangles, or more precisely of tangle diagrams, modulo Reidemeister 2 and Reidemeister 3. So it's not quite tangles because we cannot undo kinks and later we will talk about what exactly is the difference and the difference is minor. But still, uh, so it's tangle or it's really tangle diagrams modulo Reidemeister 2 and 3. And on the right there is the temporally lib uh, planar algebra, which is the planar algebra of um, uh, basically crossingless tangles, so planar pictures like the one shown here, uh, modulo uh, an additional relation that a circle, and I mean an internal circle, not the external circle, not the boundary of the, of the picture, but if there is a circle made of strands, then it's equal to D, where D is uh, the same D as before, uh, namely it's negative A squared, negative A to the minus 2, and, and all of these planar algebras are over uh, Laurent polynomials in A, which means that uh, you can take uh, linear combinations of such uh, of tangles or of uh, temporally lib elements uh, with coefficients in uh, this ring. Now, uh, I didn't tell you what a planar algebra morphism is, right? I only said there is one. I didn't tell you what it is. But it's a waste of your time to tell you what a planar algebra is. A planar algebra morphism is because it's exactly the same as for all other algebraic structures. So basically, it's a function that takes things to things such that all the operations are intertwined. Okay, it's exactly the same as group homomorphism. It takes group elements to group elements uh, in such a way that uh, multiplication before and multiplication after are, are, are correlated, are intertwined. Okay? Uh, maybe the only additional condition here, or the only additional thing to, to note, is that it's supposed to preserve the number of legs. So a morphism will take a tangle with eight legs to a temporary lib element with eight legs. Okay? Now, as for the proof of this statement, there is really nothing to prove. It's completely tautology. Right? I mean, uh, I, I spent a lot of time setting up things, but at the end, the theorem is empty. Because uh, very clearly, um, this, the, the, the Kaufman bracket is defined by local formulas. Um, can so, you share the screen as well? Sorry? I, I, think, I don't know if it's just me, but I can't see the screen share. I can only see the camera. Here. Ah, uh, that's because I didn't screen share today. Again, sorry, I'm, um, uh, I, 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 I forgot. Uh, where, how do you share the screen? You click here and here and here and I apologize uh, I, I simply forgot is it better now? good okay the next thing I wanted to say was that the rank over uh, uh, Laurent polynomials of temporally lib 2n is the so-called uh, nth Catalan number so basically, you know, you should think of rank roughly like it's a... Uh, so again, if you took algebra, you know what I mean. Uh, otherwise, think of it roughly like the dimension over a vector space, except 
uh, since our ground ring is a ring rather than a vector, rather than a vector, rather than a field, uh, it's not dimension but rank. Okay. So basically, the, the the statement that's being made here is that the number of generators of temporary lib two n is equal to the nth Catalan number, which is equal to one over n plus one two n choose n, which is uh, asymptotically, which is approximately 4 to the n divided by uh, n to the 3 halves times the square root of pi. So, uh, uh, I wanted to justify this, uh, but first I have to tell you what's the nth Catalan number. So, the nth Catalan number uh, is, is a problem because there is no uh, um, no easy way to define it because it has about 50 equivalent definitions and part of the fun is that to see that all these definitions are equivalent to each other okay so I will just give you uh, one definition okay and uh, the definition uh, and tell you how it's equivalent to what we're having and then uh, you can uh, look up and there, there is a wonderful paper by Richard Stanley with uh, about 50 definitions with, and, and with the graph of equivalences be, be, between them. By the way, in knot theory what plays the same role is the Alexander polynomial. So you cannot ask me how to define the Alexander polynomial because I'll give you 30 definitions. Okay, but uh, anyway, so what's the uh, uh, CN? So one of the standard definitions of CN is uh, so a, a soccer game ends with a tie, ends with the result NN, with the score NN, and you can ask yourself how many histories could have led to this score. But how many histories in which team B never leads? Okay, so this is the answer to the question how uh, many uh, histories uh, lead to uh, the score uh, one, uh, not 1-1, one, one, sorry, n, n in a soccer game uh, in which uh, team B uh, is always at least weakly behind, so never uh, leads. So, uh, for example, uh, so, so let's do a few. So what is uh, C0? So how many histories lead to the result 0, 0? Well, uh, the result is always 0, 0. And so the answer is uh, that there is only one such history. And so Catalan of 0 is 1. Uh, how many histories lead to the result 1, 1, so basically the result has to start with 0, 0, then team B cannot lead, so team A must score, and then the result has to end with 1, 1, so uh, team B scores, so the result now is 1, 1, and the answer is, well, there is still only one history. Uh, let's check C2, so C2, uh, so let's see, uh, we can have uh, zero, uh, well, we have to start with zero, zero, then it has to be one, zero, then one possibility is that it will continue to two, one, uh, sorry, two, zero, two, one, two, two, and another possibility is zero, zero, one, zero, uh, one, one, two, one, two, two. And these are the only two possibilities so C2 is equal to 2. Okay? And you are welcome to verify that C5 is equal to, uh, sorry, not C5, uh, that C3 
is equal to 5. And in fact, we will verify it in a minute. So C3 is equal to 5. You know what? Let's do it right now. So here is a lovely way to compute the Catalan numbers very efficiently. So, uh, by the way, I could have implemented it, implemented it on the computer, but okay. So here is a lovely way to compute them very efficiently. So you make a table using straight lines, uh, and uh, in this table, I will write in place uh, n m all the ways to get to score n m in such a way that the first team always weakly leads. So here is 0, 1, 2, 3. Here is 0, 1, 2, 3. So uh, to get to the score 0, 0, there is only one way. To get to the score 0, 1 in such a way that team B never leads, there are zero ways. Okay? But the more interesting thing is what happens to the right. So, okay, if I get to the score, basically, all of the score on the bottom, there is one way to get, right? If you get to the score 3, 0, the only history is 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0. And then comes the interesting ones. So, uh, uh, how many ways are there to get to the score 1-1? One, one? Well, you could have gotten from it either from the score 1-0 or from the score 0-1. And the total number of ways to get there is the sum of these two, so it's 1. Okay? How many ways to get to the score 2-1? So you could, go, you could get there the, the step before, you could have had either 2-0, which is this number, or two, uh, or one, one, which is this number, so the sum of these two is two. So basically, uh, the, uh, the, the, the way to compute is roughly like uh, computing things in the Pascal's triangle. Am I wasting your time, by the way? Is this so well known that I'm just wasting your time? Okay, so it's like the Pascal's triangle, except uh, down here you have always ones, well, I mean, this is completely consistent with, with Pascal's triangle. And above the diagonal, you, uh, you get zapped. If you try to reach above the diagonal, it's zero. Okay? So you have zeros above the diagonal, and otherwise, you just, uh, each one is the result, is, is the sum of what's to, the, the number to it below it and the number to its left. So this will be 2, now 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 5 plus 0 is 5, and this 5 agrees with the 5 that I mentioned here. And let's do one more just for fun. So 1 plus 3 is 4, 5 plus 4 is 9, 9 plus 5 is 14, 14 plus 0 is 14. So in fact, uh, C4 is equal to 14. Okay? If we're at it, we may as well give a lovely overall formula. So here is a lovely formula. So uh, the trick is to erase the label, the labels. Okay? Uh, in fact, maybe I don't want to erase them, I just want to move them a bit aside so that I'll have more room. So 0, 1, 2, 3. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another column here and put a minus 1 here. And then, uh, and then basically, a, and now every number is the sum of the, or every entry is the sum of the thing to its left, and sorry, not just here, I'll put minus 1s throughout. Okay? And now, every entry is the sum of um, whatever, be, whatever is below it and whatever is to its right, right? Because here, I'll have minus 1, here, I'll have... Sorry, no, it's not what I wanted to... Sorry, I wanted to add zeros. 
uh, here. Uh, so zeros. So that so now every entry, this these are all minus ones. This will be basically it's the other table reflected. So this will be minus one. This will be minus two. This is minus two, minus three, minus uh, five. Isn't the first column also zero? The one you labeled minus one. No, because I want every entry to be the sum of the thing to its left and the thing below it. So, so if I want to get this to be, if I want to get this to be zero, I have to put a minus one to its left. I, I mean, the, I mean the column to the right of that, the one that goes up. You put another minus one, four minus ones in line. Oh, you're right. Uh, what did I do wrong? You added minus one that was previously there, but then you made that a zero, so the minus one wasn't connected. I mean, this should represent the ways to go to something where it never reaches yeah, yeah. zero. Yeah, no, but sorry, now I'm confused. Uh, what did I want to do? I want to do minus one. Oh, so wait, so, so, sorry. So, all of these should have been minus ones. Yes, and then this is minus one. Oh, sorry, I, I shifted everything. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, all these entries I, I got wrong. So, let's see. This is a minus one, this is a minus one. Uh, this is now a minus two, a minus three, a minus four, uh, a minus two a minus five, a minus five, uh, and, and so on. Okay, sorry, I, I blundered. Um, now, uh, but now I can, uh, but now I can um, uh, write the table as a linear combination, so okay, in this table, every entry is um, the sum of the two entries below it and to the left of it. So this is true for this entry. So this entry is determined linearly by these two. But these two are determined linearly by these three. And these three are determined linearly by the four below them. So overall, Every table, every entry in this matrix is determined linearly by the two base ones, which are these one, which are these two. So, if I wanted, I could generate a similar table in which this one appears and this minus one doesn't appear and another table in which this minus one appears and this one does not appear, and then the result for the table that I want is, will be the sum of these two tables. Okay? So, uh, basically, I, uh, uh, if I'll call this table uh, C for Catalan, then uh, C is equal to uh, A minus B, where A is the table that, uh, in which I put a 1 here and then generate everything using the Pascal triangle law. And so this is A. And B is the table in which I put uh, a 1 here and generate everything using Pascal's, the, the Pascal triangle law. So here, the numbers will be uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, 1 to 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, the usual Pascal law. Here, the numbers will be, well, exactly the same, except everything is shifted. So 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, uh, 1, 3, 3, 1, and so on. 
And now if you want to know what appears in, you know what, yeah, if you want to know what appears in, in table C in this position, you look at, you, you look at this table in, at, at this position in table A, so it's a 2, and you subtract from it, Wait, am I blowing? Well, there are zeros below it, right? Because there's there's a row of zeros below B. There is a what? You also want a row of zeros oh, below Oh, 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 again, I shifted, ah, sorry, I'm, I, I, I shifted, sorry, the minus one is shifted one up, both to, both to the left and to the, and to the, and up. Sorry, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm I'm I don't know why I'm messing up today. So uh, right. So this is table B, and it continues here with a one to one, uh, one three three one, and so on. So now, if I want to know what's in uh, table C in position two two, I need to look at the two here and subtract. For, sorry, at position one one. I need to look at the 2 here and subtract from it uh, the 1 here. And I get 1, which is indeed what, what I'm supposed to get. Sorry, I, I really, uh, I'm, I'm really blundering. Anyway, uh, in, uh, in uh, table, okay, but, 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 there is a, 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 but there is a consequence. The consequence is that CNN, so the entry in position NN of table C, is equal to ANN, but ANN is just, the, is just the, the corresponding entry in Pascal's triangle. So ANN uh, so minus BNN, uh, but ANN is the corresponding entry in Pascal's triangle, so it's uh, 2n choose n and uh, uh, bnn is uh, the corresponding in entry in Pascal's triangle shifted 1 so it's uh, 2n choose n minus 1 and if I didn't get anything wrong and you do all the calcul and, and, and you simplify uh, this should be 1 over n plus 1, uh, 2n choose n, as I promised uh, uh, up at the top. And again, I apologize for all the blunders, but, 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 but the, the blunders were plus or minus ones. The, 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 the fundamental thing was right, is right. Okay. Anyway, how is this related to us? So what's an element of the temporary lib algebra? So what's an element of TL to N? An element of TL to N is a disk with an, a beginning point uh, marked and then uh, a crossingless matching of two N points. So something like this. Okay? But the moment I have a beginning point matched, marked, I can instead write it as a long line. So basically I open the, uh, the, the, the circle at the, uh, at, the, at the red point, and then, I, uh, and then I write it as a long line. So I have uh, one edge in this picture, I have one edge going from right after the, 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 the marking to right before the marking, so it goes like this, and then another edge like this, and another edge like this. But this is precisely the history of a football game, a soccer game, sorry, in which, uh, this, in which one of the team always leads. Namely, you count all the left ends of chords as a goal for team A and all the right ends as a goal for team B. 
So basically here the score was 0, 0, but now team A scores, so it's, uh, uh, the score is 1, 0. Now team A scores again, the score is, is 2, 0. Now team A scores again, the team score is 3, 0. Now team B scores, so it's 3, 1, 3, 2, and 3, 3. So write an element of the... So it, 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 basically, um, if the result ends with a tie and team A always leads, or, or at least the weekly leads, it basically means that every goal that team A scored gets matched at some point by a, a goal from team B. And these lines just indicate which goal of team A or when is the goal of team A gets matched by a goal of team B. Okay? Uh, so, uh, the so the conclusion is that the number of generators in uh, TL2N is the number of soccer games that end with the score NN and that number is, uh, we've just computed it. I don't know, how, how, much, how many of you have seen this before? It's kind of lovely, I think. I don't know, it's a... Okay. Good. Oh, sorry, there remain one more thing, and this is the asymptotics. But the asymptotics is, is sort of routine. So, um, um, uh, if I remember right, there is a formula that says that um, n factorial is roughly n to the n divided by e to the n, uh, I think probably also divided by, uh, wait, divided or multiplied by, by square root of 2 pi to the n, 2, 2 pi n. Anybody remembers? There, it's called Stirling for, Stirling's formula. I think it's multiplied, not divided. So if you're searching for it, uh, search for Stirling's formula. Yeah, it's this. Uh, so basically, take this formula and substitute it into um, um, into all the factorials that appear in this formula, and you'll get this one. Okay. Good. Um, so, by the way, so, so back again about the complexity of computing the Jones polynomial. So, uh, how hard is, or, or more precisely, the Kaufman bracket. So, suppose you have a naught k, and suppose that at the widest point, the width of the naught, namely the number of strands that cross through, is 2n. So how hard will it be to compute this knot? Well, uh, one strategy would be to cut it at the widest point into two halves, but the strategy that's, even, that's a bit easier to analyze is the one that I first presented, which was to have a front uh, uh, go up through the knot, okay? How hard is the computation? So the computation in the middle step will take, well, basically you have to, uh, you'll have an element of the temporary Lieb al uh, algebra if you computed everything below. An element of the temporary Lieb algebra is um, CN, uh, polynomials, so you have to be storing in your memory CN polynomials, and then you can check that adding an additional crossing and smoothing it is actually almost nothing. It's a constant amount of work. So the work is just moving around CN polynomials taking lin minor linear combinations of CN polynomials. I so, have a question. Yeah? 
By polynomial, do you mean uh, Laurent polynomials in the multiplied by uh, some factors of a's and d's? Uh, yeah, but the d's are negative a squared. Uh, 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 have a formula. So when I mean po polynomials, I mean Laurent polynomials in. Uh, so Laurent polynomials in uh, in a or in a to the plus minus one. Okay, so you need you need to store c n of them of those, and then you need to do very simple manipulations to them, which 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 is a constant amount of time per polynomial. So the so the so the complexity is roughly the size of c n. I'm lying a little bit. So the complexity is, well, some constant, which I'm not bothering to write, times Cn times, uh, well, you need to do it n times. I mean, I, 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 I was talking about the worst case. But typically, you'll have to do it several times, and typically, you'll have to do it about, well, a, a number of times which is uh, equal to the number of crossings or proportional to the number of crossings. So the complexity is the number of crossings times Cn where n is the width of the knot times the complexity of performing a single operation in this polynomial ring. Now, this polynomial ring uh, so you know what, let me just write it as that, so just complexity uh, of adding and multiplying, so of ops uh, in uh, uh, this uh, ring. And if I wanted to be, uh, sorry, a to the plus minus one. If I wanted to be, sorry, this came out really bad, if I wanted to be more precise, about the complexity, if I wanted to be uh, more accurate, I would have to analyze uh, also how long it takes to do operations in this ring, but I'm being careless. Okay? And, and also, the dominant factor is this c to the n. Okay? So, how bad is this? So, again, if I ignore polynomial and look only at the exponen uh, exponential factor, this is roughly uh, 4 to the power n. And you can say it's exponential. Indeed, it's exponential, but it's exponential in the width of the knot, and the width of the knot is practically, is, is, sorry, is often the, uh, or, or it can be bounded by a square root of the number of, 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 of the area of the knot, the square root of the number of crossings. So this is roughly uh, 4, to the square root of the number of crossings and uh, uh, even if the number of crossings is a hundred four to the one four to the square root of a hundred is still a manageable number so in fact you can compute the Jones polynomial for knots with up to 200 300 crossings depending how much time you're willing to waste to wait, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. That's the end of what I have to say for now about the Kaufman bracket. Later I want to come back to it, but for now that's it. Any questions, any comments? Okay. So the next thing is I want to start introducing Hovanov homology. And somehow, um, you know, I have to say that uh, when, so the Jones polynomial came in the early 80s. And following, the, following that, there was a whole theory of how to get other invariants like it. And at around, but by the time Hovanov homology came, so this was about uh, 1999, but by the time Hovanov homology came, we, and I include myself because I was already there, okay, so uh, we, we, we had the feeling that we fully understand 
not invariants of this style. Okay, we kind of know where they come from. And the answer is they come from Lie algebras and representations of Lie algebras and we will get to how they come from there uh, later. So basically I'm telling you that I'm now skipping uh, 15 or 18 years of mathematics. Uh, but at, at, at that point in time we thought we knew where invariants come from. And Hovano homology came as a complete surprise. Like nobody expected that there will be anything along the lines that I'm about to tell you. So you're sort of missing the surprise because I'm, I'm skipping the 15 years of development and going straight to Hovano homology. But we will do these 15 years, but except we will do them a bit later. So anyway, what does Hovanov says? So Hovanov finds, uh, so um, it, it, it's kind of not useful to formulate it as a theorem. I'll formulate it as a statement, okay? So Hovanov finds a graded uh, chain complex for uh, each not a diagram, so he writes a, a, a graded chain complex for each not, not diagram with properties. So whose Euler characteristic is um, the Jones polynomial whose homology, whose homology is uh, invariant, so does not change if you do under the, uh, the, the Reidemeister moves, and in fact, uh, it's an invariant which is stronger than the Jones polynomial. If it wasn't stronger than the Jones polynomial, it would probably less, be less interesting stronger than uh, Jones, sorry, uh, uh, and then uh, actually there is more, so he, he, he finds it even a little bit more than what, just what I said, but already what I said uh, was a big surprise. Uh, but now I have to explain all the things that appear here, okay? So, um, um, have people here taken algebraic topology? Okay? So, you know what? I, I'll, I'll, I'll still explain it briefly, okay? So, first of all, uh, what's a chain complex? Okay, so a chain complex is a chain of vector spaces. So uh, CR going to CR plus 1 going, coming from CR minus 1 going to and so on. So uh, where each of these is a finite dimensional vector space. So in general a chain complex doesn't have to be finite dimensional, but for us they will always be finite dimensional. Uh, and then there are maps in between them, so there is a map called the differential, and when I, w when I will want to be careful I will label the differential with the label of the space it comes from. So this is dr, this is dr, minus 1, etc. And when I don't want to be careful, I'll skip the labeling. And the rule is such that, sorry, to be a complex, it has to be that whenever you go two steps, you get zero. In other words, uh, dr composed dr minus 1 is always equal to zero. And loosely speaking, well, since this is always written as D, and this is also written as D, 
So it's really decomposed with d is equal to zero. So loosely speaking, people just write d squared. And this d squared, this two is not r. It's squaring the d operation. Okay? So d squared is equal to zero. And one last condition that I want to add is that the chain complex itself, the number of chain groups which are not equal to zero, I want it to be finite. So, in other words, I want it to continue in both sides, but I want it to start at zero and end at zero, and the part where it is not zero, so I guess this part here should be length, finite length. Okay? So that's a chain complex. Uh, I have a question about indexing. So you hear that these are in increasing index. Isn't this for cohomology? Uh, yeah, and it's a, a, a so well, yes. So the way we arrange the indices, it's a cohomology. Uh, it has no difference whatsoever. Okay. It, it makes no difference whatsoever. Okay, and and it's still called Hovano homology. So if you want, it's a little, uh, okay, the language is a bit wrong, okay? Uh, good. Now, uh, uh, so whenever you have a chain complex, there is something called, uh, it, uh, there are two things to, to define. There is the homology, so uh, first of all you define uh, so, saying that the composition of these two things is equal to zero means that the image of this is contained in the kernel of the next. So, the, it means that the image of d to the r minus 1 is contained in the kernel of uh, dr. And people usually give these things names. So, this is the uh, n, the nth cycles group, and it's called ZR. So these are, sorry, not the nth, the R cycle group. So these are R cycles. And uh, this is uh, often called the R boundaries. So this is called BR, and this is uh, R boundaries. So it's the image of dr minus ones which li in, of dr minus one which lives in CR. So these are things inside CR. Both of these image and kernel are inside CR. Now uh, homology measures by how much this is bigger than that. So you define HR to be uh, ZR modulo BR, and this is the so-called Arth uh, homology. So that's one definition, and the second definition is the Euler characteristic. So the Euler characteristic of such a chain complex is equal, is by definition, the sum over r of minus 1 to the power r times the dimension of uh, CR. Okay? And, uh, God, do I remember the rank nullity theorem? So, uh, the rank nullity theorem says, so, rank uh, nullity theorem says that the rank of, um, wait, how does it go? The rank of dr, so the rank of the map dr plus the nullity of dr is equal to the dimension of the space, so the dimension of CR. Do I have it right? Good. Uh, what's the... Uh, um, uh, 
uh, what's the rank of the R? Sorry, not rand, rank. So, the rank of dr is the dimension of the image of dr, and that's the dimension of the n plus first boundary space. Okay? So, this is the dimension of br. Ah. B uh, r plus 1. The nullity of the r is the dimension of uh, is the dimension of the kernel of the r, which is the dimension of the r. So this is the dimension of the r, and it's equal to the dimension of uh, c r. So now, let me substitute this uh, into here. Wait, something is... I'm, I'm doing something stupid. Well, okay. Uh, and I find that the Euler characteristic is equal to... Uh, No, that's not what I wanted to do. You also want to consider uh, the same thing with homology, the homology sequence, right? The dimension sequence, Yes, that, that of course is what I want to do. All right, this is what I want to do. Sorry, this is fine, sorry. So this is sum uh, of minus 1 to the r uh, times uh, the dimension of Zn, sorry, Zr, plus the dimension of Br plus 1, and uh, so I'll, I'll shift the R in Br plus 1, by 1. Okay, so if I replace r plus 1 by, by, by r here, uh, the only thing that changes is the sign. So this is equal to the sum of minus 1 to the r, the dimension of zr minus uh, the dimension of br. So basically, since r is summed over, uh, in, instead of some, in, I, I, I can switch r plus 1 to r, and the only thing is that changes is the sign that comes from here. But this difference of dimensions is exactly the dimension of the homology. So this is equal to sum minus 1 to the r, the dimension of hr, and the conclusion is that the Euler characteristic could have been equally computed uh, from the dimensions of the chain spaces or the dimensions of the homologies. And then uh, I'm running out of time. No, so I think I will stop, uh, but uh, I'll start next time by telling you what graded means and then constructing the, 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 the Hovano homology. Sorry. Um, Sometimes I'm having a confused day. Today was one of them. See you uh, next. Uh, yeah. Um, hello. Yeah. yeah. Is there a reference for the uh, the planar algebra stuff you discussed last time? I'm sure there is. Um, so, Jones has a paper called Planar Algebras, but it's written in a completely different context. So, it, it will be a bit hard to, to, to follow it. To, so, um, 
So it's written in various places, but always inside a bigger context, which never matches exactly what you want. So um, probably the easiest reference for this context is what we just did on the board. Okay. So I'll, if there are no other questions, I'll turn off the video and see you on Wednesday. Sorry, I just have one question. Sure. Um, what exactly did you mean by saying that the Euler characteristic is the Jones polynomial? Because oh, it seems still, like the Euler characteristic should be an integer or something, not a polynomial. It, it's still right. So, I mean, that goes into the meaning of graded. Once we talk about okay. graded, things will become, things that were integers will become polynomials. Okay, thanks. Okay, so see you all on Wednesday.